such. The Quran, the holy book of Islam, presents itself as the truth that was embodied in the original message that Jesus brought to the earth, but which was twisted and corrupted by his wicked followers who formed Christianity. But what did Jesus really teach? Jesus was really a Muslim prophet. Now you can think, wait a minute, how could Jesus be a Muslim prophet when he was 600 years before Muhammad? Muhammad was, uh, according to the standard Islamic story, although there are a lot of reasons to doubt that as well, but according to the standard Islamic story, Muhammad lived from 570 to 632. And so 600 years after Jesus, this guy is coming along and saying, I've got the real teachings of Jesus. Now, the way that he explains that is to say that Jesus and all the other prophets, Jesus is a prophet in the uh, Quranic scheme of things, Jesus and all the other prophets taught Islam. The Quran in chapter 3, verse 67, it says, the Jews and the Christians argue about Abraham, but they are ignorant. Abraham was neither a Jew nor a Christian. Abraham was a Muslim. Now, how could Abraham be a Muslim? Thousands of years before Muhammad. The original religion of the entire human race was Islam. That's the, the, the idea. All the prophets taught Islam. When the prophet's followers got more interested in worldly gain, in getting rich or in getting comfortable for whatever reason, then they created these false religions that were cash cows for them in various ways. There's even a story of a group of Christian priests traveling from southern Arabia. There were Christians in Arabia then. Now it's illegal for people to practice Christianity in Arabia. But they were there then, and they were traveling to meet Muhammad. And on the way, the leader, he said, we know this man's a prophet. We know that he fulfills all the signs of the prophet to come in our holy books. And yet, the Byzantines, the Eastern Roman Empire, they give us money, and they'll cut us off if we acknowledge that Muhammad is a prophet. And so when we get there, we have to argue with him and disagree with him and resist him at every turn. So you see, they were just greedy and selfish. That's all it was. And they really knew the truth. Now, that might seem to be kind of an outlandish story, but that's standard Islamic theology, that we really know better. And once presented with the truth of Islam, it's manifest and self-evident, and if we do not accept it, we are culpable. And that the true form of Christianity is Islam. And Islam in the Quran contains many, many things that are presented as corrections to Christianity. Most notable is chapter 4, verse 157, which says that the Jews say, we killed the Christ, the son of Mary. Which, of course, many Jews would take umbrage about saying, but in any case, in the Quran, they are presented as taking on this claim with alacrity and saying, we killed Jesus. And then the Quran goes on to say, and this is, of course, supposed to be the supreme God speaking, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and of Moses and Jesus and so on. And he says, they uh, are ignorant about this. They did not kill or crucify him. It only seemed so to them. And in Islamic theology, they've taken on things from early Christian heretics who said that Jesus was not actually crucified, but was a phantasm because matter and the body are evil. They didn't have John Paul II's theology of the body. And because matter was evil, the Messiah, the Savior, could not have become a human being, and if he could not have become a human being, he could not have been crucified. It only seemed like he was crucified. Somebody else was up on the cross for him. And Islamic theology actually took this over and has the idea, without the idea that matter is entirely evil, they did take over the idea that Jesus was not crucified but only appeared to be. And Jesus himself is depicted in the Quran as proclaiming the coming of Muhammad saying that after me, in, kind of in the fashion of John the Baptist, after me there will come someone who is greater than I. And Muslims actually point to the passages in the Gospel of John where the Lord is talking about the coming of the paraclete. And they say that this is a corrupted version of a passage which originally referred to Jesus talking about the coming of Muhammad. 
And so you see, with this kind of thing, that if you go to a Muslim and say, Jesus was crucified and rose from the dead in redemption for our sins, he'll say, no, they didn't kill or crucify him. It only seemed so. And if you go and you say that Jesus came to the earth as the Son of God and the Savior of the world, and he sent the Holy Spirit to live in our hearts and direct us toward the good, then they'll say, no, Jesus didn't come to say, didn't say anything about sending the Holy Spirit. He said he was sending Muhammad, or Muhammad was coming after him. And you say that Jesus is God the Son, one of the Holy Trinity, who came to earth to save us because only God could save us from our sins because only God is the offended party in all of our sins and is the one who is powerful to save us. And they will say that the Christians have exceeded the bounds of the teachings of Jesus and that the, the Quran warns Christians not to say three in terms of God, not to speak, therefore, of the Trinity, it says, cease, it will be better for you. It's a warning that hellfire awaits if you speak of the trinity of three persons and one God. God is an absolute unity, and it offends his majesty to have a son. And in the first place, the Quran says in uh, chapter 6, verse 101, that how could God have a son if he doesn't have a wife? And so there's a little bit of the theology of the body for you, but it's an anthrop a crude anthropomorphism that obviously completely misunderstands the idea of Jesus as the Son of God and as the divine second person of the Trinity. Instead, the whole understanding of Christianity is misunderstood. The Trinity itself, as a matter of fact, is presented in another passage in chapter 5, verse 112 and following. If you have your Qurans, you can follow along with these. Um, but the, uh, they probably have one in the bookstore if you, don't, uh, if you didn't bring it, if you forgot yours at home or in the glove compartment. But in any case, uh, chapter 5, verse 112, uh, Jesus appears before Allah and says, and, and, and Allah asks him, did you tell your followers to take yourself and your mother as gods alongside, with, alongside me? And Jesus says, oh no, of course not. I, how would I have said something I wasn't authorized to say? Because he's just a servant of God and his messenger. So the understanding of the Trinity, though, in that passage is clear, is God, Jesus, and Mary. And yet, on that basis, because the Quran speaks of three and not saying three, if you speak of the truth of the Godhead to a Muslim, he will think, well, the Quran has already corrected all this. And the Quran has already told us that unbelievers are those who say that Allah is the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary. So if you come and you say that Jesus was more than a prophet, he was divine, then say, well, you just don't know. It's only unbelievers who say that kind of thing. And the Quran says that the Jews say that Ezra is the son of God. I've never met a Jew who ever said Ezra is the son of God. If you ever find one, let me know. But it seems as if this was something that com com comes completely from a misunderstanding of Judaism and of Jewish tradition by uh, the early Muslims. But in any case, it, the Quran says this, that the Jews say Ezra is the son of God. The Christians say Jesus is the son of God. And Allah's curse is upon them for saying these things. So if you actually believe in standard Orthodox Christianity and Jesus as the Son of God, then a Muslim will consider that you are actually under God's curse. And I can remember, I can tell you another thing. Uh, one time, many, many years ago, I'm speaking to a Muslim and I said to him, uh, you know, Christians, we have a very much closer idea of a relationship with God than exists in Islam. In Christianity, we believe that we are God's children and his beloved, and that he is our father. And Islam is nothing like this. And the guy looked very happy, and he said, you think God is your father? And I said, yes, I do. And he said, then why does he punish you for your sins? 
and he sat back, and he was very satisfied. And I didn't understand that at all. Do you understand that? What kind of a father doesn't punish his children for their sins? It would be a very poor and indifferent father. But I only understood it later when I started reading the Quran closely and I found the passage in there. It says it in there, chapter 5, that the Christians say, we are, we are God's children and his beloved. I stepped right into it. I gave him the line. And, he sa and then the Quran goes on to say, if God is your father, then why does he punish you for your sins? And so he just gave me the Quran's line right back to me. Now the point is, is that we're talking about the difficulties of preaching the gospel to Muslims. The difficulty is, is that they have these answers and they think that Islam has transcended and corrected Christianity. And that Christianity is a misuse, a misappropriation and a misunderstanding, willful misunderstanding of the teachings of Jesus such that this correction became necessary. So how do you deal with that? Well, there are several holes in the story. One is that Jesus was a prophet, a Muslim prophet, and he got this book from Allah. Allah, of course, means the God in Arabic. It is the word for God that Christian Arabs use. I generally use, when speaking to non-Arabic audiences, uh, the word Allah for the God of Islam as in contradistinction to the God of the Catholic tradition. Now, I'm fully aware, and I should stop at this point and explain, that uh, Christianity, that, the, that uh, the Second Vatican Council, rather, has said that together with us, the Muslims adore the one merciful God. And this is a very vexed thing, too. When we're talking about difficulties, you will find Catholics who will tell you, I hope it's not your parish priest, but it could be, uh, who will tell you, well, you shouldn't preach to Muslims because the Vatican Council says they adore with us the one merciful God. They, they, they're already in, in other words. You don't need to tell them the gospel. Now, it's very important to understand that passage correctly, that the, Vatican II, the, the Second Vatican Council speaks about Muslims together with us adoring the one God. Archbishop Gerhard Mueller, who has just been named the prefect for the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, you may be familiar with him, you may have heard of him, he's just been in the news lately. It's a very recent appointment. He says that uh, God has revealed himself in love in the incarnation of his Son and in the descent of the Holy Spirit as the triune God. An incarnation of God is not compatible with the history or theology of Islam. So the difference of God the view of God in Christianity and Islam is at the substance of the faith. The Unitarian God of Islam, by his nature, does not give this love to man that's manifest in the Incarnation. Our faith is based on a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. This is not only differing appearances, but differences in nature. And so while it is true, and I think this is the basic meaning of Vatican II's statement, that Muslims are monotheists together with us, at the same time, we have a radically different view of God and should not hesitate, if, if led to by the Spirit, to preach to them with full awareness of the dangers and the difficulties, but certainly in principle at least acknowledging that it is something that can and should be done. In any case, as regards to these, this inoculation against Christianity, that is embedded within Islam. When speaking with Muslims about it, one of the things you can ask for is the original gospel. The gospel in Islam is not the good news of Jesus Christ. It is the book that Jesus received, the Injil, from Allah, like the Quran. The Quran was delivered to Muhammad through the angel Gabriel, in a perfect form over 23 years, according to the standard Islamic story. And it is a perfect copy of an eternal book that has existed forever with Allah in paradise. And Allah also, in the same way, gave Jesus the gospel, which was a book that he received. And it is not the same thing as the gospels in the New Testament, 
or the New Testament at all. That's the corrupted version that the Christians cooked up, you see. So, the thing is that at the same time, I know this all sounds crazy, I know, it's very strange, but once you enter into the mindset, it starts to make sense. It's like entering into the funhouse and the circus, and once, once you understand the inner logic, then you can get your bearings a little bit better. Uh, the original gospel does not exist. If it ever existed, we would expect there to be some manuscript evidence of it, some copies of it somewhere. It doesn't. Even worse, in the Quran itself, Allah tells Muhammad at one point, if you're in doubt about what we have revealed to you, this is chapter 10, verse 94, if you're following along, if you're in doubt about what we've revealed to you, then ask those who have been given the scriptures before you. Which means, in other words, go to the Jews who have the Torah from Moses and go to the Christians who have the gospel from Jesus and ask them. Because if the Quran is supposed to confirm what is in the gospel, then all you have to do is look in the gospel and you'll see the teachings of the Quran. So, in other words, Allah is telling Muhammad, go to look in the gospel and you'll see that what I'm telling you is true and that you're receiving real revelations from the one true God. It was only when Muhammad or the early Muslims actually did encounter real Christians and the real Christians said, well, actually, there's nothing like any of this in the gospels. Then they made up this story of corruption. But in other words, it was assumed at the time of Muhammad or at the time that Islam was originally being formulated that the gospel, the true Muslim gospel actually existed. Now, here again, this sounds crazy, but this is standard Islamic theology. As a matter of fact, there was recently a news story coming out of Iran that it was in the Iranian press, even though it re referred to Turkey. It said that in Turkey there had recently been discovered the original gospel the Gospel of Barnabas. And the Gospel of Barnabas actually does exist. You can get it from Amazon.com. And the Gospel of Barnabas, it tells the story of the prophet Jesus, the Muslim prophet who said that Muhammad was coming and he was not the son of God and he was not crucified and he was not the savior of the world. He's just another one of the prophets, the next to last prophet. Now, the Gospel of Barnabas has actually been known for, for centuries, but it is pretty clearly a 16th century forgery that was written by Muslims in order to fill this gap. But there actually is no original Gospel. There's no sign of it. There's no trace of it anywhere. Any sign that there was ever any sect of Christianity that was anything like Islam or taught anything like what Islam teaches about Jesus before the time of Muhammad. And so one of the things that you can do is patiently and carefully explain that if the original form of Christianity was something like Islam, how does it vanish from the earth without a trace? And why is it that if Muhammad got a revelation that has been supposedly miraculously protected from error, because that's another Islamic claim, that the Quran has been, there are no manuscript variants. You know when you get a Bible and you're reading along and it says, and it's got a little footnote and it says, other ancient authorities say this, and they're never big variations, but there are variations in various texts because the people who are, the text itself is infallible, but the people who are transmitting it are not. At the same time, in the Quran, you will never find any textual variants. And they say the, the book's been miraculously preserved from the beginning. Now, that's hooey, of course. There are textual variants, but they just pretend they don't exist. And the upshot is that if the Quran has been miraculously preserved all these centuries, why is it that Allah was unable to preserve the original message of Jesus for all this time? There's more, too. Jesus, according to Islamic tradition, and his mother are without sin. Even Muhammad is rebuked for sin at one point in the Quran, the beginning of chapter 80. But Jesus is sinless, and Mary is sinless. Jesus will return at the end of the world. Muhammad will not. Although when he does return at the end of the world, according to Islam, he will break all the crosses. 
because, of course, he was not crucified. Christianity is a corrupted version of the true message of Jesus. So in the Islamic scheme of things, Jesus is going to come back and destroy Christianity as an insult to the truth that he taught. But it's still weird. If Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, the last and final and greatest prophet, why is it that Jesus is the one coming back? And Jesus is born of a virgin in the Quran. Muhammad's not. Jesus is designated the Word of God, the Word of God in the Quran. Now, of course, the Word of God is extraordinarily, is a, is a phrase, is a term that's extraordinarily fraught. And we understand it as a translation of the Greek, the Logos, as meaning that Jesus is of the nature of God himself, is God. In the Quran, this is specifically ruled out. It says that Jesus is like Adam. Oh, there we go again. Jesus is like Adam. Muhammad's not like Adam. Jesus is like Adam, in that God only says to him, be, and he is, i.e., he's born of a virgin. He doesn't have a natural conception. But here again, Jesus is the word of God, even though the phrase is downgraded. Jesus is born of a virgin. Jesus is like Adam, which is obviously a trace of the Christian understanding of Jesus as the new Adam. Jesus will return at the end of the world. Jesus is sinless. How on earth could it be that Jesus enjoys all these singular privileges and Muhammad does not, and yet Muhammad is the greatest prophet? 